We're not building institutions for our community. We're not making a safe environment for our men, women, and children. We're not providing jobs. We're not providing opportunities. Black men are not what our ancestors were, and we are not what our community needs. It's no way around it. Look at all the professional black men who not only abandon the community, but who marry from outside the community, which is another form of betrayal. You mean to tell me all of what you earned came at a sacrifice by ancestors because you don't make it to the NFL and NBA if we don't go through them struggles. You understand me? You don't make it to the Ivy League University if those ancestors before you didn't go through them struggles. So you're going to use all this ancestral sacrifice to achieve your quality of life and then give it all to a non-African woman. Financial betrayal. Playing devil's advocate, though, uh, based off it, I say you wouldn't you wouldn't think that, like, technically the sacrifice was for them to go out and be able to date that white woman? You're telling me that the sacrifice of our ancestors from resisting slavery through the Underground Railroad to fighting Jim Crow, to fighting Willie Lynch, to fighting civil rights, to fighting black power. Are you saying that you feel the ancestors would be okay for a black man to abandon black women and marry a non-African woman, that that would be consistent with the sacrifice that they made? That's, he played devil's advocate, though. I, know I, he I mean, I mean, I'm asking. I mean, I'm asking. <laughs> Is that the devil's advocate? I mean, the, I mean, the way you put it that way, I mean... <laughs> In my diary, just open and admire me. I praise who inspired me and write like I'm retiring. Meditations, all the wisdoms, no, I've been given. Speaking to my niggas like this language is forbidden, and you know it's really different. Some niggas won't get it. Speaking to conditions from these systems that we live in, and these sins ain't forgiven. Roller coaster to a prison. So let's pray to God so they sold us religion. Like, we don't know our history, just take what we've been given. Wake up every day, and we just trying to make a living. Pros and cons of the matrix. When niggas go pro, but never say this, they don't want to risk it, and we get frustrated. Like nigga, you the voice for the ones that never made it Put that pressure on them And so my self-hate shit, they never speak up And niggas turn racist But not against these crackers or these systems We've been faced with these niggas start to hate the Thank you for tuning in to another Devil's Advocate episode I'm your host, he I'm the co-host, And we got a very, very special guest in the building This guest honestly don't need no introduction Y'all already know who he is Dr. Umar Ifatunde Dr. Umar Johnson a uh, certified school psychologist, doctor of clinical psychology, author of two books, Psychoacademic Holocaust, The Special Education and ADHD Wars Against Black Boys, and the latest book, Black Parent Advocate, The Art of War for Dealing with America's Public and Charter Schools, Pan-Africanist, uh, currently renovating America's first independent black school to be based on the principles of international economics and the principles of Marcus Garvey's Pan-Africanism, and the first school to be purchased, renovated, and operated with funds donated from African people from every continent in the world. And that's a heavy resume. <laughs> yeah. I don't even know how somebody <laughs> could follow up after that. Yeah. <laughs> glad to be here, though. Glad to be here, fellas. Glad to have you on. But honestly, I want, I want to come in high, man, because I already know, um, you know, what's been going on in the media, you know, mm -hmm. about this Kyrie Irving thing. Right. You know, Kyrie Irving uh, posted a anti-Semitic, uh, well, alleged, you know, anti-Semitic uh, documentary. Mm -hmm. um, From Hebrews and Negroes? Yeah, the documentary mm -hmm. title, uh, Hebrews mm -hmm. and Negroes. He just yeah. posted uh, just the, the link to it on uh, mm -hmm. Twitter. And what are your thoughts on that? I would say, well, first we went allegedly anti-Semitic Alleged, right, because... Yeah. I haven't saw the documentary, but everyone who I've spoke with, they said they didn't see anything anti-Semitic about it. Okay. People are saying that the ADL simply branded the documentary anti-Semitic because it did not coincide with their narrative of what they want people to believe about Judaism. Mm. And I think that the Kyrie Irving situation, similar to the Kanye West situation, is speaking to an attempt to silence the voice of the unapologetic heterosexual black male. That's what I'm seeing. I look at Kanye and Kyrie as a uh, test run on this new agenda to see if we can get black men to keep their mouths shut about issues that are relevant to black people. Mm -hmm. This is about First Amendment freedom of speech. 
Is this that- is not about anti-Semitism. It's about can we shut the mouth of black males? Because protest has always been the foundation of liberation. If I can't speak out about what's happening, I can't do nothing about it either. That's- so if I can get black men to shut the hell up, we'll be able to do anything we want to black people. So I see Kanye and and Kyrie as a test run by the white power structure, which includes the European Jewish community to try to see if they can get black men to keep their mouth shut. And we can't allow that to happen because once we get silent about the things that matter, we as a people begin to die. And I also think it's very interesting too the manner in which the media is presenting the uh, Anti-Defamation League as if they are a fourth branch of government. Okay, so in college, I was a political science major. And as we all know from high school or college, there's three branches of government, Congress, the legislative, Supreme Court, the judicial and the president, the executive. Well, lately with this Kyrie and Kanye situation, they're trying to make the Anti-Defamation League the fourth branch of government. It's like president, Congress, Supreme Court, and ADL. And it's almost as if if the ADL says it's anti-Semitic, you have to believe it's anti-Semitic. If the ADL says Kyrie hates uh, European Jews, you have to believe Kyrie hates European Jews. Since when did the ADL become the interpretive branch of government for black folks That's a good it's question. like they're yeah. going to interpret for black people what is racist and what's not mm-hmm. what other community goes to another community and tells them i have the right to tell you what's acceptable or what's not i think they're out of hand and to be honest with you as someone who respects all cultures all races i think that black people need to call the european jewish community out for their racism what about the role they played in the transatlantic slave trade They were some of the biggest slave owners. They were some of the biggest slave sellers. They were some of the biggest insurers of the slave ships. And they were some of the biggest banks that provided loans for slave voyages, as well as holdings for those who made money from slave trafficking. Why don't nobody speak about that? The secretary of war for the Confederacy was a European Jew and a slave master. Why nobody talks about that? What about the Holocaust and the fact that there was only 50,000 Africans who were also incinerated with European Jews, but they're not mentioned at all in any any, any Holocaust museum? What about the fact that there was a group of African soldiers from World War II, from America, who went to Nazi Germany and liberated the European Jews from their worst internment camps And they're not celebrated nowhere by European Jews at all. So if we want to talk about racism and if we're going to talk about anti-Semitism, let's talk about Semitic anti-blackness. That was a lot. That was a lot. That that was a lot. That was like very, it's a lot to dissect. Yeah. But what I got from that was, um, you know, you saying that like, how can you, how can they, playing devil's advocate, right? This was a podcast Mm -hmm. called Mm -hmm. Devil's Advocate. It's like, how can we tell them that they not, offended by something that they call anti-Semitic. Like mm-hmm. us being black people, why can't we have our own beliefs and, and our own views on things, uh-huh. right? So I think every people is entitled it. to their own opinion. The Absolutely. only thing you're I, not I guess, entitled to I guess what I'm saying is like us being black, how can we tell them that that's not offensive and and I'll tell you why. Okay. If I disagree with the way America was created Right. Mm -hmm. A white person says is anti-American to say this country was built on slavery and racism. The country was built on slavery and racism. Me stating a fact doesn't make me anti-American. Me saying that the original Hebrews were all African, that there were no white Jews in Kemet is a historical fact. That doesn't make me an anti-Semite. In order for me to be an anti-Semite, I have to promote the hatred and oppression of Jews. To be anti-American, I have to promote the hatred and oppression of Americans. For me to be homophobic, I have to promote the hatred and oppression of LGBTQs. Mm -hmm. You follow me? So to be anti- The key word is the hatred. The hatred. You have to be about hatred and bigotry. That's where freedom of speech stops. When you promote genocide, when you promote harm, when you promote extermination, when you promote bias, discrimination, racism, now you're being anti. But to say I am the original Semite. 
That's a historical fact. Show me proof of any white Jews in Kemet. Show me proof of it. There is, there's no white Jews at the time of the Jewish occupation of ancient Egypt. Right. There's, there's none. Have you, uh, they took over the religion the same way white people took over Christianity, the same way the Arab took over Islam. They conquered it and claimed it. So it's no secret how Jews became white. It's the same way Americans became white. Islam became Arab. They moved in, they conquered, they took it over, and they claimed it. That's the history of European imperialism. And they colonized religions the same way they colonized continents. Have you uh, seen the documentary? I have not. No, I have that. not. I'm not a big fan of religion. Uh, you know, I support our Hebrew brothers and shout out to the Hebrew Israelites who went and protested at the Barclays Center in support of Kyrie Irving. Shout out to them brothers. I was one of the first, if not the first person to say there needs to be a protest at Barclay. I thought the black community was going to rise in protest mm -hmm. and they didn't. So I want to thank the Hebrew Israelites for doing it because that was definitely a show of support that Kyrie uh, needed to see because we did not come to his aid the way that we should have. Given the fact that over 80 percent of NBA players are white, given the fact that nearly half of all NBA teams are owned by European Jews, the past commissioner was a European Jew. The current commissioner is a European Jew. Black people represent about 40 percent of the revenue. Uh, we overwhelmingly represent a disproportionate share of the sneaker sales uh, from Nike and all of and of course, sneaker sales, sneaker sales mm -hmm. are fed off of they are a subsidiary of the athletic performance on the court, right? So I'm buying the Jordans because I like how Jordan played. I'm buying the Kyrie's because I like how Kyrie plays. So the sneaker sales are a related sell to the NBA, to the NBA atmosphere. So I think that if there's any sport where we need to be speaking up and speaking out, it's NBA. Our influence financially in terms of revenue, in terms of athlete, athletes percentage who are black, in terms of uh, how much of it we view. If black people need to be speaking up about anything, we need to be speaking up about racism in the NBA. So just piggyback off of you were saying with, um, you know, the First Amendment right and not having a voice to speak up about anything, right? So when you think about the NBA, and how much power that as a black people in general, as a consumer and as the players have, what effect do you think will happen if we were to stood behind Kyrie and not watch the NBA and not, you know, support the the Nike buying Nike or just buying like Adidas or anything of, of that nature and be like, this is buy back buy back black or anything like that. What do you think the impact would have um been with that? It would be tremendous because as I always say, white people on, or the white power structure rather only responds to three things of uh, blood, money, and numbers. You understand? Mm -hmm. So your money, your organized numbers of influence or war, that's the only thing they respond to. Given that we're 40% of the NBA's revenue, if we were to make a stand, if we were to say we're not watching these games, we're not buying no apparel, we're not going to be streaming your, your, your games or showing up to the stadiums, they would have to change their tune. So yeah. we we could have single handedly saved Kyrie ourselves. The problem is we haven't had a um, heritage of activism, systemic activism since Dr. King's murder. You're talking 68. So that's yeah. 78, 88, 98, 08, 18, 1921, too. So Dr. King's murder, April 4th, 1968, that will be. What, 55 years, I guess I want to say, 78, 88, 98, 08, 18. Yes, 55 years on April the 4th, 55 years. That's a half a century. We have done nothing as a people systemically to impact our condition politically or economically. I definitely agree with you with that. And this is why nobody take black people seriously, because it's been so long since we've done anything. When is the last time we stood up? I mean, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, who we love and respect, he had the Million Man Marches, but there was no work attached to it there was no serious movement attached we didn't get the million more movement till 10 years after mm -hmm. the million man march so you know that was more it was a beautiful event i was i went i attended every one so definitely no disrespect there but in terms of a political analysis there was no movement attached to the million man march from the outset of the million man march and i just think that dr king Despite all the criticisms people may want to levy at him, he was the last leader to give us a significant social movement for change. And of course, honorable mention, 
I would say the Black Panther Party. So that would be Fred Hampton and, of course, the late Huey P. Newton. But Fred Hampton, who had just been elected um, national spokesman for the Panthers when he was assassinated. In fact, I would argue that's one of the reasons he was assassinated Mm -hmm. because he was just elected national spokesman. I would say Dr. King followed that. Those those were the last two systemic threats. Okay, Dr. King. Obviously, the greatest threat at the time after he was gone, it automatically became the much younger, much more radical, militaristic and idealistic Fred Hampton. After they took out King and Hampton, we haven't had anybody since to come with that type of energy. Mm. Definitely agree with you with that. Uh, I seen one of your Insta, uh, one of your Instagram posts you posted it was a picture of you, uh, Kyrie Irving and, you know, yay, and you had uh, titled it the three headed monster. Mm-hmm. Uh, what do you feel like y'all three can accomplish together that y'all can't do uh, apart? Well, one of the things with me, you know, I like to act in a role of a consultant. That's something we're trained to do as psychologists, right? So mm-hmm. I consult. Even when you do therapy with a client, you don't tell them what to do. You consult. You mm-hmm. understand? You try to get them to see what it is they need to do. So if there was ever a secret meeting, and it would need to be secret because I don't think Kanye or Kyrie could survive the fallout of knowing that they publicly associated with someone as unapologetically as myself. So it would be a secret relationship and a secret meeting. I would give them ideas for things that they could do to really impact the black reality. And to that end, uh, when I'm looking at Kanye, who's a billionaire, uh, I'm very disappointed in our black billionaires, whether it's Kanye or Jay-Z or Beyonce, whether we want to go to Oprah or Tyler Perry or Sean Puffy Combs or LeBron James, Not a single black billionaire has built a relevant institution for black people yet. And when I say relevant institutions, I'm talking about schools, hospitals, supermarkets, banks, distribution and manufacturing sector distribution, obviously, to give our people the basic needs to survive in manufacturing, to provide our people with jobs. Those are the six key industries and not a single one of our billionaires have built a uh, significant or a relevant institution. They have attached their names to charter schools, but charter schools are owned by the state. That's not a black institution. You understand me? Those are state institutions. What about Jay-Z with uh, prison reform? What has he done with prison reform? Uh, Uh, Because I, I've heard the conversation, mm-hmm. but I haven't seen anything tangibly that has changed yet. Now, I saw them change the law so that hip hop artists cannot be held accountable for, you know, their lyrics that they put in their music cannot be used against them in the court of law. And I'm not even sure if that's a good thing, to be honest, because if you're rapping this type of stuff, you need to be held accountable for it or change the content of your music. But just saying I'm involved in prison reform means nothing. What law have you changed yet? If y'all know of one, let me know. Yeah, oh, so I see where what point you're coming from because I know with prison reform they they did like open up old cases okay. like people that was like um they got, they got locked up for um a crime they didn't commit or didn't do. So That's not prison like reform, home. though. That's tokenism. Okay. Yeah, you, you so understand. You me? As to- Let like me give you an example. A- when Barack Obama, uh, the last year of his term, right yeah. before he left office, he commuted the sentences of thousands of Americans, yeah. right, of every color. That's not prison reform. You know why? Because there's nothing systemically being done to change the way people are charged, tried, sentenced, and treated in prison and released. Right, yeah. When Donald Trump was towards the end of his year, he commuted a lot of sentences, including Lil Wayne. He and threw his case out. Yep. We go to Detroit with our brother, who was the former mayor, Kwame Kilpatrick. He released him out of prison, right? Mm-hmm. But that's tokenism. You know why? Because I chose you. I'm not doing nothing about what your people are going through. Okay. I'm just going to single out Kwame Kilpatrick. I chose you. I'm not doing nothing about your people, but I'm going to single out Lil Wayne. We have yeah. to be careful to not allow tokenism to substitute for systemic measurable change. i give you another one. They'll talk about the economy and they'll say, well, we got a thousand more black millionaires in America than we had 20 years ago, right? That's tokenism. There's 50 million American Africans. Don't you dare try to distract from the poverty, the underachievement, the homelessness that the millions suffer from and try to distract me by saying there's a thousand more black millionaires. Progress is in the group, not in the token. 
Don't single me out and say, well, you got six degrees. You never been to jail. You're a doctor. You come from the ghetto of North Philly. Why can't every black man do it? Do because do, every right? black man isn't given the opportunity that I was given. See, we have to make sure we don't buy into this narrative of the power structure that wants to take individuals, examples of success and use that to chastise all the failures so we can blame our people yeah. for where they are. I definitely agree with that because, like, look, if you could do it, then if we can do it, then you can do it. So I never, like, like I look at the Kodak Black situation where Donald Trump um, got Kodak Black out, and I follow Kodak Black on, like, Instagram and social media, and he always, like, man, bring Trump back into the office because for him, he got you out of jail. So for I can him. understand how, how you feel personally. Mm-hmm. Exactly. But when he, was in, when he was in as our president, like, the... The way the country was going, it was like it wasn't good for us as a whole. It wasn't good for us at mm-hmm. all. Like even like with the police brutality, that mm-hmm. wasn't. He did he nothing about it. He, he did, did nothing, nothing about, about it. it. Not only so that, it covers that behavior. So yes. I understand that Kodak, but like, well, yes. I'm out of jail now. But, but you know what we call so, that? Wait, wait. So you think uh, Kim Kardashian? So her, you know, partnering up with Trump and getting a getting those, you know, people out of jail. You feel like she could have been doing more. You feel like all right? No, 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 no. Wait, wait. Just, just that's not prison reform. But I reject her involvement completely do you want to yeah. know why Cause, no no because there are actually what, what black with, female lawyers who donald trump could have worked with to get black people out of jail don't go get some whore from hollywood <laughs> with no credentials and legitimize her as a prison activist for black people when you got thousands of black female attorneys who've been on the front lines fighting, fighting against human abuses against black people and you're not going to validate them but you'll validate a white entertainer to do it I totally reject her participation Maybe. and we need to be careful with that because if you sit back and say it's okay for Kim Kardashian to be the political prison activist for black people you are validating right the silencing of the black voice in lieu of a white Jesus figure who you think can better champion you than you can champion yourself. Devil's advocate, right? Maybe maybe he used her for her influence. Because Kim Kardashian and the Kardashians have a real big influence, though. What is she influencing as it relates to the prison situation? Just, just, just like her followers and just the influence, nah. just how much attention she so can she, draw. He to probably things. saying like, so I know sometimes they may she have ain't bigger than Beyonce, she ain't bigger than Jay Z, she ain't bigger than Kanye West, she ain't bigger than Tyler Perry. She that's ain't debat- bigger than Oprah Winfrey. That's, that's actually debatable though, to be one hundred percent honest though, because at the end of the day, when you plan with, and don't get me wrong, don't quote me on this, because I'm mm-hmm. really not strong with politics. Understood. So Understood. I don't want to put my foot in my mouth, Understood. but you know, when you, I guess, when you dealing with Trump and you are dealing with politics, and you know, you want that second term and. You stuff like that. You want to use people with real big influences to no to white work. person can advocate a black issue better than black people and black people should never allow a white person to advocate your issues mm-hmm. because if you let them speak for you, you are basically invalidating your right to speak for yourself. The first of all freedoms that we've ever fought for was the right to speak for ourselves. Remember during uh, abolition. The fight against freedom. You had the American Anti-Slavery Society. You had the American Abolitionist Society right out of Philadelphia, mind you, right? Even uh, James Fortin helped fund and found the American Anti-Slavery Society. Did you know you could not even be a member? These are white people fighting to end your slavery. And you are not even allowed to join them. Do you want to know why? Why? Because even though they was fighting to end your slavery, they still consider you to be inferior to them. When Frederick Douglass started speaking for the American Anti-Slavery Society, why did him and William Lloyd Garrison fall out, the white man who discovered him? You know why they fell out? Because he only wanted Frederick Douglass to talk about what life was like as a slave. When Frederick Douglass started articulating the anti-slavery position, they said, time out, ex-slave. We didn't ask you to intellectualize the struggle. We just want you to give your story of being a slave. Leave the intellectual analysis to us white men. Do you understand me? And Frederick Douglass said, I didn't leave one slave master to join another. My point is, why would you let a white person argue your fight? Mm -hmm. Kim Kardashian don't know what it's like to be a black man or a black woman. Mm -hmm. Most people on the planet are black. And therefore, any black billionaire would be far more influential in our issues than any white billionaire could ever be. Kim Kardashian, no, you never let another race articulate your wrongs. What did Frederick Douglass say? A man who has the ability to fight for himself but chooses not to has no right to be fought for. If you ain't going to stand up and speak for yourself, 
Why would you want somebody else to do it? We don't need no damn Kim Kardashian. That was a distraction to mute your voice. Here we go again. First Amendment freedom of speech. Put Kim Kardashian out there. And while we distract the world with Kim, all the black women who've been fighting for black people to get out of jail, their voices get silenced. Hell no. Yeah, speaking of that, though, you did uh, you, you did pull something like that because Dave Chappelle had a 15-minute monologue. Did you listen to that? I think I heard most of it. Saturday Night yeah, Live, Saturday Night on, Live on, on, the, on the Kanye situation. Like Kyrie Irving, yeah. Yeah, yeah he, you know, he had a 15-minute monologue. He had a bunch of jokes about it. I, I actually heard it. Um, uh, the next day, he had like a bunch of blogs ended up coming out saying that he was kind of, quote-unquote, normalizing anti-Semitism. Mm-hmm. And you ended up posting saying that as black men, as black heterosexual men, you said... Uh, our, they want to they want to silence our voice yeah anti-semitism uh, is just a tool they're using to today yesterday was lgbt tomorrow it'll be the fact that you're anti-immigrant the next day it'll be because you're misogynistic and anti-woman the tools change the agenda stays the same and so here's the issue what is the definition of power politically speaking power is the ability to define reality and make people accept your definition What the Anti-Defamation League is trying to do is they're trying to define what is racism and what isn't. They're trying to define what is Mm anti-Semitism and what isn't. And they're trying to get heterosexual black males to accept their definition as rule. If the Jews want to define racism for black men, why can't black men define racism for Jews? Because who is the main group promoting, publishing, printing, Distributing and financing financially exploiting gangster rap music in America. It's Jewish. People. According to Russell Simmons, did you see Russell's narrative? Yeah. It's, it's- Russell, although he was trying to portray it in a positive light, he basically admitted mm-hmm. that the Jews control hip hop and have robbed and exploited it since the first day it came on the scene. Yeah, I remember. Um, Charlamagne the God had one of the record label owners yeah, there. Cohen. Yeah, Cohen. Leo Cohen was said on that. It. Why would you do that if? if this type of music is promoting killing one another and, and what the did greater he say? woman. He said, I, I got, got, pe- I got people to feed. Yep, I got a So to feed. it ain't okay for y'all to do it to us. Yeah. But it's okay for us to do it to y'all. And guess what? I don't blame Lee or Cohen for that. And I don't blame the European Jewish community for that. I blame black people for that because we don't stand for nothing. I took my mother to the movies yesterday to see Wakanda Forever. Mm-hmm. Right? This a warning, y'all. If y'all didn't see Black Panther Wakanda Forever yet, skip the timestamp 2918. And I was very disappointed. All in right, this no movie. spoilers. Though. I still ain't see that. <laughs> well, <laughs> I didn't go to the movie to see Mexicans beat up on black people. Okay, uh, the underwater yeah. people was uh-huh. Mexicans. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay, uh-huh. they basically gentrified the movie for Mexicans. The Mexican <laughs> hero, you no, saw it. Yeah. The Mexican I, I hero. Didn't see it yet, but I, I know he had the more air. Spo- right, spoiler free version. He, he, like, he had more air time in the movie. Okay. Than anybody from Wakanda. So they should have. It shouldn't even been called Black Panther. Yeah, it should have been like, called the gentrification of Black Panther <laughs> by the Mexicans. But here's the point I want like to get to. Breaking here's the that. point that I want to get to. After the Mexican god kills Queen Mother Angela Bassett, he murders her. All right, that's a spoiler. Shuri, oh Shuri, my god. Shuri has a chance to murder him back, and, and instead she exercises patience. And says we can work together. And what does the Mexican woman say to the Mexican at the end? Why are you forming an allegiance with Wakanda? Yeah. You should have destroyed them. And what did he say? Don't worry. They trust us now. The Wakandans are the most powerful surface nation in the world. Mm. And we got them while where we want them. So even in Black Panther, we don't <laughs> learn our lesson. We are vicious with each other. Never vicious with our enemies. Never vicious with our enemies. You got to force a black person to spend a dollar with another African, but we will give $30 billion to the Korean hair care establishment every single year. And the Koreans have never stood up for black folks a day in our life. We are literally financing our own oppression. And we don't want to admit it because we do not want to discipline our economic dysfunctional behaviors. I'm going to let that slide because you Dr. Umar. I hate, spo- I hate spoilers, spoilers though, but sidebar though, I did a did whole see? video on spoilers. I did a whole split on void spoilers though, but listen. We don't own that. That's you, Disney. Did you, did you see, um, did you see uh, the first one, Black Panther 1? Yes, I did. How you feel about that one? The, the messages were horrible. 
Uh, the cinematography was excellent. Shout out to Ryan Coogler. You deserve 5,000 lashes for that second one. Though. <laughs> you also deserve 5,000 lashes for the messages in the first oh, one. Man. The messages in the first one were horrible. Basically, Killmonger was a metaphor for woke black Americans. Mm-hmm. Prince T'Challa, the Black Panther, was a metaphor for conservative Africans on the continent. And the message was to Africans in Africa, don't mess with those woke black Americans because even though they woke, they're not going to respect your culture. And if you let them come to Africa, they're going to destroy everything you value sacred. And the message to African Americans was black people in Africa don't want nothing to do with you and they do not trust you. So you should just best stay here in America and try to work with us white folks. And then to make it even worse, the CIA agent Ross, the white man, the white guy. He saves the day towards the end of the movie in the yeah. first movie. How in the hell can the CIA be the savior of black people when you murdered King, you murdered Malcolm, you overthrew Kwame Nkrumah, you helped uh, the apartheid government track down and arrest Nelson Mandela, you participated in the assassination of Amakal Cabral, you had input in Thomas Sankara, you executed Patrice Lumumba, uh, uh, you overthrew Maurice Bishop in Grenada. We could go on and on and on, on. about the CIA. The CIA has been Africa and African people globally they have been our biggest problem for 50 60 year how dare you make them a hero in our movie i got a question black action, panther man. was a cia fbi propagation movement i know y'all i know i hate ads too but i gotta let y'all know that this devil's advocate episode is sponsored by capital punishment games capital punishment is the party argument game so if you're the type of person that like laughing that like cracking jokes that like arguing with their friends all in a good name of fun capital punishment is the game for you so you can go to capital punishment game.com or you can just type in capital punishment game on amazon and you can find it there Prop- like, propaganda how, speaking movie. of like you were saying lashes bro how many lashes do you think charles barkley deserves about a million lashes, <laughs> a million lashes. somebody <laughs> find charles <laughs> and rip his ass disappointed man I was black so people are the what did he say? He black said, people are the worst it comes attackers to, of LGBTQ. You can't say that. You can't say that. Can't and no, we're not. Of, it's not. We're the most sympathetic people. But he's a coon. See, here's what I want, want y'all to understand. Charles Barkley, Shaquille O'Neal, Stephen A. Smith, Candace Owens, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, they're a problem, right? But as much of a problem as they are for us, don't confuse them as being a real problem. They're a symptom of a problem. Mm-hmm. Explain Candace, it. Explain Charles, it. Shaq, Stephen, Charles. Supreme Court Justice Thomas. What do I mean by that? It, like, They're a, a symptom, symptom of, a of a problem. Explain that. The problem is we have no system of accountability and reward for our community. You control behavior with systems of accountability and reward. At your job, you go to work because you're going to get paid. If you don't show, you don't. You, you understand me. In, in, in most countries or most communities, if you, let's go to the Italian mafia in their heyday, they had a rule. You don't kill children, you don't kill women, and you don't kill elders. If you do, you die. Yep. Do you understand me? Everybody has a, that's how you control behavior through an accountability system of reward and punishment. We don't have that. Why do you think there's no Charles Barkley in the Mexican community? They don't have somebody like a Charles Barkley. A prominent sports figure who constantly degrades his own people. There's no Shaquille O'Neal for the Chinese. There's no Candace Owens for the Latinos. And Shaq really confused me about speaking out about Kyrie when you literally own like like five Papa Johns because he he bought into their franchise. Right. Even though the man and was Papa saying John racist saying stuff about black folks. Right. All on TV. He like, don't care. He just, Shaq don't care. The biggest blackest thing in America. He's a super coon. But again, there will be more Shaqs. There will be more Candaces. Mm-hmm. There will be more Charles. There will be more Stephen A's. You're going to get more Judge Clarence Thomases who said he don't know what the word diversity means. You're going to get more of them because the community has no system of accountability and reward. We're the only people who have no system of accountability and reward. Muhammad That's why Muhammad. if Candace, Candace Owens, if she was Chinese, Arab, East Indian, Mexican, European Jew, she might not be on the face of the earth, right? First of all, she would have never done it. Yeah. You're not doing Candace Owens. If, if you belong to one of those races, you don't do what she's doing in, in one of those races. Charles Barkley, Shaquille O'Neal, they would have never even done it. You're not doing that. Yeah, that's ain't no yeah, your the Jews ain't letting you do that to them. It's, it's ain't pretty, no Arab letting the Arab stand up on national TV yeah. and throw his old people under the bus. 
this should be punishments, but we don't have any. That whole that whole situation where because like you know the podcast is called Devil's Advocate. Where I try to play Devil's Advocate, yeah. but it's hard to play Devil's Advocate to that because like in 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 situations like all right, you I watch Dave Chappelle a lot, listen to stand up mm-hmm. and stuff, and he had like a a skit when he was talking about the uh, the Jesse Smollett thing, right? Okay. Yeah. And not even to get to details with that, but like one of one of his jokes, and of course I'm not gonna repeat the joke because mm-hmm. I might mess mm-hmm. it up, but he was saying like you know with black people, he said. A lot of people say, yeah, why, you know, when the whole Jesse uh, Smollett situation first came about, he said, why a lot of black people, he said a lot of white people used to come to like, you know, come to black people like, yo, why a lot of black people didn't, you know, come to like, come to his defense in the beginning? Like, ain't, no, ain't nobody speak up. Like a lot of people not speaking up. And then Dave Chappelle said, he said, uh, black people come into his defense, but y'all don't know that our silence is us helping them out. Because we know because we, it's one of those situations like, like, allegedly because you you know he because we know he was lying so my whole thing is like with the whole you know Shaq and you know Air, go down the yeah. whole list of everybody who says something my whole point is like rather if you agree with it or you don't agree with it just why did you say something like you you didn't you didn't have to like go in and front of a million you could have made you kept you rather if you agree with it or you didn't agree with it because you that's what coons do for you yeah. to just sit there in front of millions of people to call that man an idiot because he, he got a family he like you just gonna get up yeah, there and so, discredit him yeah. that that was the whole thing i couldn't agree with but let's look at the other side if charles barkley would have done that 60 years ago Black people would have went to the studio where he airs the shows, and we would have protested the hell out of that till they fired him. Mm-hmm. You know, we would have done that. We don't have any integrity anymore as a people. Anything why? Why goes. you think so? Because we have lost though. our way. After integration, we thought we made it, and part of the sacrifice in thinking we made it is we gave up our traditional values as black people money was never the most important thing for black people until after integration and then hip-hop played a big role in the destruction of integrity for black folks because the hip-hop generation became the first generation to out earn their parents outside of the athletes so when the drug dealers and the gangster rappers started making more money than their parents, everything changed because they now became the economic opportunity in the community. And then the white Jewish music execs went to the artists and said, listen, the churches are trying to shut down gangster rap. Go and give them some money. And when they started making donations to the churches, church protests against gangster rap went away. Yeah, You got to look at it. And then how. Also, because they were the money, they became our role models. Yes. They became our, our, our yes. public figures. And I always think about what Muhammad Ali said. He was like, uh, with him, he like, you could give somebody, a, a poorer person, a million dollars, and they'd be quiet. But he said, I'd rather say what I got to say out my mouth, because that will help millions of my people versus me taking this money and sitting here and being quiet. And everybody doesn't everybody doesn't have that within them. Like, um, I give you much respect for that, because you speak up whether you get a lot of pushback or not mm-hmm. about how you feel and what your beliefs is. But it's also about being real to who you are, right? So when I look at my journey through black consciousness, I went to Mead Elementary School at 18th and Oxford in North Philadelphia, four or five walking blocks from Marcus Garvey's UNIA, which is right next door to Hollywood Sneakers where my mother bought most of my sneakers mm-hmm. during childhood. So anyhow, when I went to black history class in the fourth and fifth grade, that was my awakening to black consciousness. It was also my awakening to public speaking because that's when I began to start speaking publicly in the oratorical contest. The point that I'm making, fast forward now to 2020, 2022, 2010, when I kind of exploded on the national scene, what have you, I was loyal to this before anybody knew who I was. You understand? I had already made up my mind that I wanted to save my people psychologically and politically. A lot of these jokers have been raised in an atmosphere of get money by any means necessary, necessary. not get free by any means necessary, Mm -hmm. not help your community by any means necessary, get money by any means necessary. So when money becomes your God, there is no integrity. That's fair. There is no integrity. And we have to get back to who we are. We don't value money. We respect it because it is necessary. Money is a force. It is a power and it should be respected. It should be appropriately used, but it must be kept in your place. The minute you say get like 50 cents album, get rich or die trying, that is the ethos of European capitalism. That is the ethos of European uh, imperialism. When the white man enslaved us, it was justified under 
get rich or die trying. Mm-hmm. So we have to be careful because we're literally buying into some of the very same economic narratives that enslaved our ancestors. Mm-hmm. That's crazy. That, and and what about like, let's just bring it back to the like the even with the rap music. What what, uh, what role do you think that played today, in the violence in Philadelphia, the gun violence in Philadelphia? I was These on homicide rates are like you know I yes. think we're on pace of breaking a record that we did last yes. year. Yes, yes. You know, and it's, and it's and it's mostly I'm not gonna say all. It's mostly our you know our young black brothers. Three main ingredients to fratricide are miseducation, economic castration, historical self hatred, and indoctrination. Right? We don't control the schools. We don't control the economic order and we're not responsible for the indoctrination of self-hatred that we suffer from i don't blame gangster rappers for black on black crime it predated them however i do blame them for glamorizing and popularizing it the responsibility of the artist is to express the reality under which you live but it is also to project a new reality If you look at a painter, a writer, a sculptor, a singer, you reflect the reality you experience, but you also project a new one. What if? And my issue with the gangster rappers is they are not projecting a new reality for our young people. And they are very much hypocrites in the fact that you claim to be keeping it real. You claim this is who you are, but you live in a white suburb and your kids go to white private schools yeah. <laughs> so why is it okay for you to sell this as being real and then people will say well wait a minute dr umar you don't say the same thing about actors look at all the movies coming out of hollywood yeah. you know what the big difference is everybody knows this is a movie everybody knows this is make-believe everybody knows this is made up but hip-hop has the aura of being a real life thing a authentic reflection yeah. Of the life the artist lives. Absolutely. So it is a reality show more than it is a made up movie. And that's why gangster rappers have to be held responsible because responsible because they're glamorizing and popularizing black self extermination. And they're getting away with it because they're making money as they do it. Like you saw that meme where they were saying Jeezy told y'all to trap or die, but his kids graduated from college with man Absolutely. and everything like that. It, 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 it's 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 Gangster rappers are some of the biggest be- the biggest traders in the black community. But I can't separate them from the community too because we gave birth to them. Let me give you an example. The reason our young black males don't have role models and, the, and they, so they got to get them off television. You know why they got to get them off TV? The rapper is not the role model. The exactly. basketball player, the football player would not be the role model if the black professional did not abandon the inner city. The only reason why your son got to snatch little Wayne and little Dirk and LeBron off TV is because he don't see you in his community. Do we talk about that all the time? 75 years ago, the dentist, the lawyer, the engineer, the author, the scholar, no matter how much money he made, no matter how many degrees he had, he still had to live in the ghetto because there was no integration yet. You follow me? They lived right with us. So we still had identity. We still had unity because the millionaire was right across the street from the person on public assistance. But after integration came, it destroyed that and it stratified the oppression you see. And so once adult black male had the opportunity to escape the ghetto, we did. We abandoned black boys. And that's how the rapper became the role model. You feel like that that was the problem though because devil's advocate, you see cases like Nipsey Hussle and you know where big influencers or, or people that, that try to help the hood with a lot of money stay in hoods and you know they do die in their own community especially nowadays where you see it happen at a rapid rate but you're talking about individuals you're not now, speaking so. systemically about successful black men in other words systemically if successful black men were still in the black community, I'm talking think, about people like lawyers and, and yeah. doctors and stuff. Yeah. Oh, even uh, school teachers, even no, right, even, even you even, said role models and seeing them from on TV <laughs> and stuff. That's what I thought. Well, was no, divine. what I'm saying is they're getting the role models off of television because everyday black men who could be the role models oh, okay, have right. moved to the suburbs. I get what you're saying. You understand? Yeah, yeah. So even the bus driver, even the post office brother, a lot of them 
are in the suburbs now. Mm. So a lot of our boys, the only men around the drug dealers. are those breaking the law. Yep. Everybody else has ran away to a white community. I would argue gangster rap never evolves from hip hop if black men were still in the community. I don't even think that's the right. Yo, it yo. wouldn't exist if black we black men would have never allowed us to create that type of music. If there's adult black male supervision, there is no gangster rap. NWA never happened. Mm -hmm. Look, think about this, right? We come from the same project in South Philadelphia, right? Let's think about coming outside our our, our house on a regular day basis and having somebody who lives next door pulling up, right? Maybe in a new fancy car, but he's a lawyer. Imagine him or just uh, seeing another working man, right? Or our male, like you said, the postman. Walking around the neighborhood is somebody who's actually from and the neighborhood. And he's spending time with y'all. He's spending time. He's talking to us. Come on. We're going to go eat. We're going to talk. Dude, Sit down. Let me see your homework. What, what would have happened for, to our future because Eddie gave us a, a different perspective on things that he's walking around the corner and seeing such and such is doing this. And this is the only way of form we see of getting actual getting money. Like, you know, like just growing up, imagine how many um, positive role models as men, not women. I'm talking about men. Have you seen that didn't sell drugs or didn't stand in a lot? It's not too many. You get what I'm saying? So it, the, the successful men have the left. Good, they, they have left. So I definitely agree with when that. When you look at the definition of manhood, we as black men, I'm speaking systemically, I'm not talking individuals. We as black men have failed to fulfill that definition. What, we, is, it, what is your definition? We now? don't provide and we don't protect. Those are the two essential definitions, mm -hmm. right? It's larger, but those are two core. Mm -hmm. Any definition will include them. We're not building institutions for our community. We're not making a safe environment for our men, women, and children. We're not providing jobs. We're not providing opportunities. Black men are not what our ancestors were, and we are not what our community needs. It's no way around it. Look <coughs> at all the professional black men who not only abandon the community, but who marry from outside the community, which is another form of betrayal. You mean to tell me all of what you earned came at a sacrifice by ancestors because you don't make it to the NFL and NBA if we don't go through them struggles. You understand me? You don't make it to the Ivy League University if those ancestors before you didn't go through them struggles. So you're going to use all this ancestral sacrifice to achieve your quality of life and then give it all to a non-African woman. Financial betrayal. Playing devil's advocate, though, uh, based off, of, I say you wouldn't, you wouldn't think that, like, technically, the sacrifice was for them to go out and be able to date that white woman. You're telling me that the sacrifice of our ancestors, from resisting slavery through the Underground Railroad to fighting Jim Crow to fighting Willie Lynch to fighting civil rights to fighting Black Power, are you saying that you feel the ancestors would be okay for a black man? To abandon black women and marry a non-African woman, that that would be consistent with the sacrifice that they made? That's, he played devil's advocate, though. I, know I, he mean, I, mean, I mean, I'm asking. I mean, I'm asking <laughs> is that the devil's advocate? Man, the I question. mean, the way you put it that way, I mean. It's so horrible. They didn't even ask that question. Man. Come on. Yeah, no, I mean, that's true, though. He, it's so horrible to even ask that question. <laughs> You that's know, funny, it's, it's 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 just take Kobe Bryant, right? Who I consider the greatest basketball player of all time. He died. He left a billion dollar empire to a Latino woman who ain't thinking about thinking about using any of that money to help Philadelphia or help black America. Look at that. That is black money in a non black woman's hands that will never make its way to the black community. When you marry out of your race, it is a form of financial economic betrayal. It's no way around it. But what do you call his kids, though? His being kids mixed. are black. They're black. So mixed race Africans, from a pan Africanist perspective, we accept them as full blooded Africans unless they choose not to identify with the race. So there's no separate standard for them. If you got a white mother or a white father, but your other parent is an African and you identify as African and you live as an African, I accept you no differently than I accept the two of you. And in conversely, you two are all black. But guess what? If you want to coon with a white girl and if you want to coon with the power structure, I reject your asses too. Yo. So my rules are no different. They're the same for all African people. I'm a pan-African. And so whether you're in Africa, the Caribbean, whether you're right here in New Jersey, whether you mix race or full-blooded African, the rules are the same. Are you biologically black and are you psychologically black? Bro, look, I had to bring this up. I was watching one of your lives one time, man. You, you know, he was doing donations for the school, right? Mm -hmm. Fundraising for the school. And then I, whoever this brother was that you know, 
um, he had a white wife, and he was like, "Man, thank you for the money, brother." But I'm gonna send that back to you because yes, you're <laughs> you a contradiction. Yeah, I said a you are a walking <laughs> contradiction. You couldn't take and, the donation, no. no. And I and 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 I gotta be firm on it in that somebody has to show some political integrity in our community, right? And it just so happens that the responsibility of upholding political integrity has fallen to me. And I have no problem with it at all. That's why they'll do the memes with me, with the uh, undertaking music every yeah, time somebody every time. got the snow bunny thing yeah. popping off. I don't mind that at all because mm -hmm. we need some political integrity, right? Somebody has to let Shannon and Steven and Charles and Shaq and Candace and uh, Justice uh, Thomas know your behavior is anti-African and unacceptable. And you're lucky we live in America because some of you may already been punished by now. Mm -hmm. You have to have a code of honor. And we don't have one as a people. And that's why other people don't respect us because anything goes with black folks. Yeah. Anything Speaking goes. Speaking of that code of honor, right? I like how you said it because honestly, I really felt like a lot of them shit and just say nothing. Right on air, but they have to publicly. prove their loyalty to the power structure. Like publicly, like you know, like it's, it's certain things that people do in your day to day, you know, life that you probably don't respect, but you're not going to embarrass them right. out in a the, right. in the supermarket. But that's how they earn the conversation kudos. for your house. You know, that's a conversation. Yeah. Like we was taught that, like you know, sometimes you don't get a public a show. When mm -hmm. we began this household, my mom always taught, taught me it's consequences behind your actions. So I felt like they law they they don't they don't follow that uh, model anymore. Because they want the money. But, no. re but remember, there's a historical precedent for this. On the plantation, in many plantations, and there's a good book called In the Matter of Color by Justice Leon Higginbotham, a black man who wrote extensively on slave law in the 13 colonies. And one of the things you learn when you read that book or any other book on the slave code is in many colonies, the only way you could get your freedom was to snitch out another African. It was the only way you could get free was to expose an impending revolt or an impending runaway. So when you look at Charles Barkley, Shaquille O'Neal, what you're looking at is the 21st century Uncle Remus, that field or house Negro who said, listen, Uncle what? Remus, Remus that's a which is one of the caricatures. So that's why they call Uncle Ruckus that in Boondocks. Probably, yes. Yeah, it, come from that. it comes from that. Right, okay. You see, you because in order to improve your relationship with the power structure, you always sought to undermine your brother. You follow me? So this is a personality type. Mm -hmm. Out, you know, from a African-centered psychological perspective, Charles and Shaq and Candace, they suffer from personality disorders. They suffer from European personality disorders. See, it is dysfunctional to work against your own people. So from our frame of reference, they could be considered mentally ill for that type of behavior. So let's bring it back to uh, what you said about the, the memes and, you know, how you feel about that. Mm -hmm. I, I did wanted to because, you know, even hearing you talk about this whole interview, you sound like a preacher. Like you talk with so much yeah. passion and even how you pause with your words like you make people just want to stop and listen to you. You mm -hmm. sound so serious. Like, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? You, mm -hmm. you speak with pride. Mm -hmm. So me knowing like, you know, how serious you are with your words and uh, how do you feel about like people creating memes about you and like, you know, like how to joke it's, circulate around? Like, do you like do that make you feel some type of way or do you actually look at it and think it's funny? It's a double edged sword. It's a double edged sword. Uh, my interviews on some of the biggest media platforms, a double edged sword. The so-called celebrity aspect of who I am. It's a double-edged sword. Why do I say that? Celebrities only have one responsibility. Entertain and go home. They don't have to organize nobody. They don't have to struggle against nothing. They don't have to put their life on the line ever. They don't have to build no institutions. I have to do all four. So when people call me a celebrity, I often correct them, say I'm not a celebrity, I'm an activist. When so people say I'm a big fan, no, you're not. You're a big supporter. Activists have supporters, celebrities have fans, and I have to constantly remind people of that. The reason why my life is about activism and transformation. I am very much a activist and a pan-Africanist and a nationalist and a revolutionary. The celebrity side is a benefit in that 
it takes my message global. Anything I want to say, I know a million people are going to see it in a month, right? Yeah. That's the good thing. Yeah. Instant audience. The bad side is they see me as a celebrity. Kevin Hart does his comedy, he go home. Meek Mill does his rap, he go home. Will Smith does his acting, he go home. Jill Scott sings her songs, she go home. Joel B plays his ball, he go home. After Dr. Umar is done the lecture, he don't go home. He's on the phone all night helping parents save their kids. He's on the phone all night finding out how he's going to fight and organize against miseducation and mental health exploitation. You follow what I'm saying? He's on the phone. What are we going to do about police genocide and racism? I do not live a celebrity life because I'm not a celebrity. It just so happens that somehow, some way, through some manner, being as quote unquote controversial as I am considered I've been able to break in through the mainstream of media in a way I don't think no black activist has ever done in the history of this country No, it's like Malcolm X being the biggest name in, 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 in children's media college media grassroots media and even mainstream you follow what I'm saying it's like yeah, yeah. for what he stands for how was he so po- white women be memeing me? Yeah. You understand they, me? They see you in the the mall. snow bunnies yeah. be memeing me. They stop me for pictures. Yeah. White people, Asians, Mexicans, Arabs. I take pictures with every, everybody. You understand? Yeah, and I do that like, because I want to make sure people. It's like, what? I wanted to clarify like, that because some people like think that when they see his message that he's racist. And he's like, exactly. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm that, that, not that's racist. The, I, I, don't have, I don't have like. Like hate towards a white person. Yeah, that's, I, why, I, I yeah, that's why. Yeah, I was trying. Yeah, I was trying to like clarify that. That's like, why I uh, take the picture. Like, like not take this, that as like disrespect, but it's yeah. like almost like I don't hate you, but you don't take that as like you want to take a picture with me. Why? So you can show everybody that, that like, I took a picture. With that Dr. I took Umar. a picture with Doctor Umar, who They're claims he it. don't like white people. Yeah, but I don't claim I don't like white people. But My you understand a mis- racism. But you understand yeah. a misconception of exactly. It. They're taking the picture from the celebrity side. I just took a picture with one of the most popular black conscious personalities in the world. That's how they see it. The reason I take the picture is it's important for my people. I don't even take the picture for them. I take it for us because black people are so afraid of being called racist. Black people are so hypersensitive about being branded a bigot. I take the picture with the whites, the Mexicans, the Arabs, the East Indians, the Native Americans, the Latinos, so black people can say, oh, he's not a racist. We can work with him. We can support him. Yeah. Do you understand? It's because of our fear. I'm sorry, Dr. Umar. I wish this nigga just die. Just Ooh. die Dr. so you can stop coughing. Oh, my <laughs> God. I can't help it, bro. Must, must my throat got dry. I just, just die. Right. Jesus Christ. You know, I ain't cough. I ain't cough. <laughs> the whole time I was here, I ain't cough, bro. The whole time. What is a more amu? A more omnia just means, like, love all. That's it. It's just as simple as that. Everybody should love everybody. So that's why I came up with that name. Like I did six years in jail. Mm-hmm. So during that time, like when even from the moment that I stepped in to the moment that I left out, I went through like multiple changes. Me realizing that I basically left my kids behind and I had to do something different yeah. so that when I got out, I could stay out. Uh, what events in your life that caused you to become who you are today? Because like a lot of people know Dr. Umar, but uh, who is Umar Johnson? Right. It, it it goes back to black history class, fourth and fifth grade, Mead Elementary. That was the birth of both my introduction into the study of self, black consciousness. And it was also my introduction to public speaking because we had a black history month oratorical contest. So I won first place in the fourth grade. I won first place in the fifth grade. And I never forget how I felt in the sixth grade when we came back from summer break and I found out that there was no more black history class. I think I cried because I loved it so much. And it's funny. I ran into one of my classmates from back then brother by the name of Jonathan and I told him I was into black consciousness and he said you've been into black consciousness now mind you I'm not even remembering he's like you don't remember I said wait a minute I was this then he said yeah what are you talking all you talked about was black stuff right so he's reminding me Uh, that in elementary school yeah he's like yo you been this I didn't even realize that 
I knew I remember loving black history. I don't remember preaching it to my classmates, though. He told me I was preaching it back in the fourth grade. He said, I knew this would be you. Like, <laughs> and was that? Like- and, and I'm going to add to that. Remember now, Mead Elementary is right around the corner from 16th and Cecil B. Moore, which is the Garvey building. That's about to ask. So you you from Philly, right? Yeah, North Philly, born and raised. So when I graduated from undergrad, that's when I finally met the elders at the Garvey movement, 96, 97, and joined that, right? And I never left, you see. And then that was, I can't, 2000, I got my master's as a school psychologist, came back home to do my internship to get certified, was with the UNIA, I resigned in 05 and I blew up in 2010. But, but I would also colors. I would also add to that my relationship to Frederick Douglass and Bishop Wayman of the AME Church. Now, Bishop Alexander Wayman, he's one of our unsung black heroes. He's the seventh bishop after Richard Island. He's the first bishop to write a major history of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. And he was one of the original uh, station masters of the Underground Railroad Office in Philadelphia. William Still, who recorded recorded the largest collection of slave narratives, Mm -hmm. he actually got that office from my ancestor, Bishop Wayman. Then you have Frederick Douglass, both of them from Eastern Shore, mind you. Frederick Douglass, you know who he is. Well, Frederick Douglass and my four times great grandfather were first cousins. They grew up together. He's the cousin Stephen that Frederick talks about. I was going to ask narrative. you about that. How you how you know that? Though I can't help it. It's okay. Yo, I'm about to shoot it, this. Bro. Well, the information was passed to me. Because I was going to say, yeah. How you uh, family, find out that that was your cousin? Family tree, family history. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? I didn't have to do no research. It was already known. You feel me? So it just passed down to me. I went to a family reunion in eighth grade. I think it was sixth or eighth grade. My father took me to Baltimore. Frederick ran away from Baltimore to freedom, right? And we're walking in his yard and there's all this Frederick Douglass stuff. So I asked my father, mind you, I just took black history class. I'm asking my father, what's all this Frederick Douglass? They had his hat, his clothes, his Bible. He said, you related to him. And in that moment, after the black history class and And, then then, finding out related. It was over. It was over. It was over. I remember my dad told me I was we was related to Eddie Murphy. <laughs> ah, wow, wow. He lied. Okay, <laughs> of course okay, he okay, lied. Okay, okay. So for me, rightly or wrongly, I believe that I was born to do what I do. That's why I can go as hard as I go. You feel me? This I, I was put on a planet to do what I do. It's not a coincidence I'm related to Frederick Douglass, in my opinion. It's not a coincidence I'm related to Bishop Wayman. It's not a coincidence I grew up a few blocks away from the Garvey building. Because if we don't live in that neighborhood, I don't go to that school. I don't get that black history class. I don't ever meet the elders of the Garvey. You follow what I'm saying? So when you look at the way it all worked out, it had to work out that way. If I'm not elected Black Student Union president at Millersville University in the fall of 95, we never go to the first Million Man March. So I'm just looking at how everything just kind of laid it out. And if you were to say, what is the one moment in your career where you realized who you were to the people? It would be 10, 10, 15. Remember Minister Farrakhan's Million Man March reunion, October the 10th of 2015? Mm-hmm. I went to that, me and two of my buddies. We showed up. I'm just going to listen to the minister, you know, fraternize. We walk on the mall. I think we got there about one o'clock. Somebody said, could they take a picture? Take the picture. Somebody else said, can they take the picture? Take the picture. Somebody else said, can we take the picture? Take Mm -hmm. the picture. The next thing you know, I look up and there's a line of about a hundred people. I said to myself, are they all here to take a picture with me? Mind you, I'm not introduced. Nobody know I'm coming. We sneak. You feel me? Mm, yeah. This line is over. I go over here. Another line of 100. Minister Farrakhan is done talking. That means we've been taking pictures for six hours. I still got a line. And where do you think that come from? Like, was that uh, before the Breakfast Club interview or after? Before, because <coughs> this is... Ah, great question. The first Breakfast Club was... 2015 this is 10 10 15 so that breakfast club was probably july or august Mm. september october so the breakfast club probably has something to do with a lot of them Mm. but not all of them you you follow what i'm saying and so now mind you many of the big names of the conscious community happen to be there too i'll never forget it right it's this long line i'm looking up on the hill i see all the conscious and they staring too everybody's amazed like 
is this nigga Jesus? <laughs> what, what year did <laughs> Hitting Colors? You did Hitting Colors. That's, yeah, that's that I was uh, inch, that was uh, twelve or thirteen, maybe. Yeah, that's why I was. Telling, uh, and I explain was to the him. viewers uh, what Hidden Colors is, though, because he was talking to me. Right, about it's that. a documentary on the hidden history of African people. I was in the first three, mm-hmm. and so, and then I was in Out of Darkness. I was in a uh, War Against Black Boys. I was in Eleven A.M. I was in. I've probably been in more documentaries than anybody else in the conscious community. Um, And of course, I'm working on my own now. uh, Psychoacademic war against black boys. But the point I'm making is. I looked at the faces of my colleagues, for lack of a better word, they was all there. I'm not going to name them. They was all there. And they're staring because they don't have no line. Don't get me wrong. Some people came up to them, but they don't have this that day. As far as I'm concerned. The ancestors made it clear who is king of this. Who next? It was it was next? it was crystal clear who that's was there. Crazy. We before you came, we literally was talking about that moment in the back. If you remember, and that's really all I'm gonna say on camera. But we're, we was literally talking about that moment right there. That and that's and wait, y'all, y'all weren't at ten to fifteen. No, no, no. no. Okay, literally okay. the moment, like that epiphany, that that mm-hmm. moment that you literally just described, where you just mm-hmm. looked up and you just. You know, you just seen, knew it. It was you like, just knew it. That like we, was the day we was when, talking about that moment. That was the day when I said to myself, although you know that you are serious about what you do and stand for, you got to recommit yourself that much more. And you need to be that careful because you got so many people who believe in you. I took pictures with kids from seven to elders up to 80. You, you follow what I'm saying? Because I have the most diverse following in the conscious community. People always say, you know, a Dr. Umar audience because you're walking there and you'll see every age from seven to 70. And they Nobody catch else you, got They want to catch you slipping so bad. Oh, yeah, they want to catch me slipping. But it was that day that I realized who I was. Mm-hmm. And it's never been the same since. So 10, 10, 15 will probably be put in my biography for the day that I really realized what I mean to my people. <coughs> and now it's just crazy because everywhere I go, I get the love, which is reinforcement for me to stay focused. You feel me? Every Absolutely. time somebody stopped me on the street, bro, you the reason I started my business. You the reason I got out of jail. You the reason I'm not in jail. You the reason I didn't divorce my wife. You the reason I didn't take my life. I've heard it all, bro. You and the reason I didn't look at that white girl. Right. <laughs> <laughs> You're the reason I'm no longer with the white girl. I get a lot of those. And the thing for me, you, you gonna help me kill him? <laughs> you got, you got to know where that is. I understand, bro. <laughs> but, but 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 the thing is, the work I do is a very hard work. I got detractors. I got haters. Don't get me wrong. Ninety nine percent of our people love me, but that one percent who don't, they are very aggressive and committed to my destruction. So sometimes it gets tough, bro. Sometimes you just sit there and be like, it take Damn. courage, right? Oh, it takes hell of courage. This ain't, this ain't easy. Oh, it ain't easy. It take Nobody courage. see what I go through off camera, bro. Like when I'm going through with FDMG, you have no idea what I've been through. Sometimes, man, I just sit there. I can't quit because I know I'm born to do it. But sometimes I'm just talking to the Lord. I'm like, Lord, am I supposed to win? Am I supposed to lose? Am I just going to be an example of what could have been? Or are you going to give me the victory for the people? You know what I'm saying? Because yeah. it'd be tough, man. Some days I go and sit by the water. And I'm just like ancestors. Breathe a new life into me, man, because they they... they you want to know why I you feel like I'm losing? You want to know why my opinion why you can't stop? And I'm pretty sure I'm not even about to give you a super deep, you know, right. uh, 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 reason why. Mm-hmm. Like, but the reason why you can't stop, and which is so dangerous about fame and notoriety, nor, notoriety, is because like you came so far and people know who you are that you can't stop because once you stop, people still know who you is. So you can't just that's go. That's correct, but you, that's not my motivation. But that's, I that's what you but said. that's still yeah. enough that, to that, get that, motivated that. though. Once you you can't come if this far to turn around I agree. and just go get I agree. Job. But I think that motivation would suffice for someone who's caught up in appearances. I agree with you. But for somebody but for somebody like me who be, who spiritually believe he was put on the earth to finish the work of the ancestors, that would not be my motivation. I'd give you mine. I agree with what you said. What's your motivation? It's just Dr. Not, Umar? My motivation is this. I'm one of the last ones who still talk it and walk it the way Fred did, Garvey did, Malcolm did, Mega did, King did. You follow? If I quit, all them little ones in fifth grade, 
all the ones in college, all the ones working on a doctor, you follow what I'm saying? They'll never try it if I quit. Because for some of them, they're like, he the only one. I've had, I had a man come up to me, no lie. He was probably 50 or 60. He said, I'm telling you right now, you better not fail us. He said, you're the only reason why I ain't gave up on life yet. When somebody older than you, old enough to be your father, tell you, you better not quit because you damn near the only reason I'm still living. I said, did he just basically tell me that if I walked away, he might take his own life? I'm not saying he said that, but it sounded close to it. Do you feel me? So I know there's people who I'll never meet who are watching me and praying for a victory. Not for me, but when that school opened, it's for us. How you deal with the pressure? I stay close to the most high as much as I can. I prayed before I came here. Before I came in, like I do before I speak on the lecture. Backstage, I always pray. Give me the words I need. Make sure I don't say what I don't need to say. Make sure I say what I need to say. I try to stay as close to the Lord as, as possible. I try to stay as close to the ancestors as possible. My spiritual system is Ifa. The system practiced by the Yoruba of Nigeria. That's what I'm into. I was raised Muslim on my father's side, Christian on my mama's side. I respect both religions, still read from both books, but my foundation is African spirituality. It saved my life. I've been studying it since my first trip to Africa, 2005. So it's been 17 years ago. In fact, um, the 19th, which was Saturday, I did my black parent boot camp in Philly. It's a training I do to make sure parents know how to uh, advocate for their kids. That's the 11th anniversary of me getting my Yoruba name at the Oyotunji village in South Carolina, November the 19th of 2011, which is Ifa Tunde, Ogun Tade. So Ifa means destiny. Yoruba culture is based on the belief that we're born with a purpose, that we negotiate with God before we incarnate. When you are born through the trauma of childbirth, you forget the memory of your purpose. So through divination and prayer and study, you remember why you're here and you have to fulfill. Ifa Tunde means destiny has returned. Ogun is my archetype. So when God <laughs> created the world, he created certain powers to help with the management of universal affairs. And one of those powers, one of those energies, one of those deities, angels, for lack of a better word, is Ogun, who's the energy of power, truth, strength. And I am born under the energy of Ogun. That's the guardian angel that walks with me uh, in this life. Ogun Tade means Ogun wears the crown. And so Ifa means I'm supposed to be a priest of Ifa, but Ogun walks with me. And I know why, because if any other Orisha was assigned to me for this life, I don't know if I would make it. Ogun is the Orisha of power, vitality, commitment, masculinity. You feel me? He built for this. And yeah, so yeah, yeah. I believe that had Ogun not been who God chose to be with me in this life, I don't know if I would make it. I know why Ogun, because many people thought I would be a son of Shango, who's the spirit of the king. He's the he's the leader, the organizer, the orator. So everybody said he got to be Shango and he a Leo. That's Shango, but I wasn't. And then they thought I was Obatala, who's the Orisha of consciousness and righteousness and all things intellectual. Since I'm an intellectual, a lot of people thought Obatala, <coughs> who also has leadership qualities. I was neither one. I was Ogun. And I know now because without that iron, Ogun is the energy of iron. He owns all metal. Without that iron in my blood and in my spirit, I couldn't survive this. You believe in uh this is a really sad question. Go ahead. You believe in reincarnation or you believe is that, uh, or you believe in the life? No, both. You were here before. You were here before. I was here before. We was here we was here many times. You keep on coming until you fulfill your destiny. Only when you fulfill your destiny can you stay up with the most high God. Wow. In Yoruba I culture, thought I thought it was either or. No, no. In Yoruba culture, we say that heaven is home. Earth is the marketplace. You come here to do your bidding, my brother, and then you go back and sit at the feet of the Most High. And even when you reincarnate, there's a part of you that always stays in heaven because, you know, we exist on two levels. We exist in this dimension. We also exist in a spiritual dimension. Right. So that's what we call Ori Ipan Ri. That's your do your double, your soul, your higher self that exists in a spiritual community in heaven that helps guide you down on this life. And ironically, if I'm not mistaken, according to the reading for the year, this is a year when your Ori Iponri is very prevalent in your life. So your double in heaven is very prominent in your life this year. So you should call up and speak to it. Speak to your higher self. Your double, like your, 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 
you, 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 your soul has a twin. You, it, it, it's the it's the other part of who you are. It's your higher self, right? Your higher self is in heaven right now, looking at you, and that's your true self. This is just the representation of the essence of who you are. Talk about the meat is of itself. <laughs> How about the guy, bro? <laughs> Last That's question. Crazy, Last question, Dr. Umar, man. What's the biggest misconception about Dr. Umar? The biggest misconception about Dr. Umar is that I don't take my work seriously. The biggest conception about Dr. Umar is probably that I live for the lights, which I don't. I'm very private, like Ogun. Ogun is a reclusive. He stays to himself. He don't like to be bothered. I'm very night and day. When I'm with y'all, the people got my time. When I'm on stage... The people got my time. But if there's nothing I need to do with the public, bro, I don't need to come outside. I'm one of them people who can stay in the house for 60 days and never walk out. As long as I got enough food, I got my, my, my movies. I watch scary movies. I was raised on that. So I do the old school Jason, the old school Freddy, the old school Michael Myers, the old school Scream. That's me. Me and my mom, we watch scary movies or whatnot. We go to the movie. We were just there yesterday. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm, I'm a movie goer, museums. I read. I meditate. But I don't need to go outside. I don't party. I don't smoke. I don't drink. I don't do... I'm not a nightlife dude. Never been. I'm a very old-fashioned person. My grandma, rest in peace, she says, I'm an old soul. And I am. I, I don't need much to be entertained. When we did our uh, spring break trips in college, mm -hmm. when I was president of the Black Student Union, I just stayed on the beach. And they were like, bro, you came all the way to Daytona Beach to stay on the beach? We going to the club. We turning up. We getting some weed. I'm good. That's all. You know, I was good every day. I loved it on the beach with the water, just thinking and reading my books. Most people look at me like this, this nigga boring. That's who I am at that's heart. Dr. That's Doctor Umar. All right. Uh, last thing, you know, uh, you ever heard of Bad Bad Baby? That's the name, Bad Baby. Bad Bunny, Bad, Bunny, no, bad no, Barbie, Bad whatever, something. Whatever that that's the that, that's the girl that was on um, Doctor Phil. Doctor Phil. That's the cat. The me Cash outside, Me Out guy. Cash me outside, girl. What's up with it? Did, she, did you say the, the the hoes are laughing? Yep. So the audience are a bunch of hoes. Yep. Catch me outside. How about that? Huh? Catch me outside. How about that? Catch you outside. What does that mean? What I just said. Literally went viral, started a rap career, millions of followers, all that stuff. But what's why right, are so, people drawn to her? What, what's her, what's her, her niche? niche? What's her? She literally got famous off a viral clip that went. That was the viral clip right there. Cat, the Cash Me Outside girl. She ended up getting a record deal because you know, like people stupid, right? Okay. Ended up getting a record deal, whatever the case may be. <coughs> Recently, that, that happened back in like 2017, if I'm mistaken. 2017, she was, uh, I think, like. 15 at the time. Okay. Uh, so she recently ended up like getting literally plastic surgery and all that stuff. And, and now she looks like literally this on the right. Yeah. Okay. okay. She looks like this now. Okay. So uh, I ended up. She changed I, the whole look. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. She looked like. Uh, I just wanted like without context though. She looked like a black girl now. I, I, I'll tell you this. People love to uh, appropriate our culture. The DJ Collins, the Eminems, the DJ Vlads, her, the Kim Kardashians. But I need you to understand something. As much as people like to enjoy and exploit the benefits of black culture, whether it's music or dance or song or food or dress, they never wouldn't be mistaken for black people. I promise you, if she gets pulled over by the police, she will let them know she's not black. You understand me? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When DJ Khaled gets pulled over by the police, I promise you, he makes it clear to them that he's not black. And for me, I'm very disappointed in us for allowing people to appropriate our culture the way in which they do, because it is a profound way of exercising disrespect towards us. How dare you take the fruits of what it means to be black, but take none of the struggle with that? None of these people have fought with us against police brutality. They haven't fought with us against mass incarceration. They haven't fought with us against uh, police genocide and access to wealth and all the issues that we have. They simply take the fruits of what black culture has to offer and they benefit from it. But they never take any of the scars, none of uh, the blood, the sweat, the tears, none of the trials and the tribulations. And for me. This is why I think a lot of people have lost respect for black people, too, because it's like for all you people have been through. Why don't you keep to yourself 
those cultural things that can make other people rich. You don't see nobody exploiting a Jewish culture. You don't see nobody exploiting Mexican culture. People freely exploit black people with no type of shame in their game at all because we and our low self-esteem as a race and our desire to be wanted and accepted by everybody we have literally made ourselves the laughing stock of the world we have to get our integrity back stop letting people exploit our culture if you're not black you cannot participate in this and then we turn right around and get mad when somebody wins rapper of the year who's white, who's white. or DJ of the wor- of yeah. the year who's not black and we get angry. Uh, they say Eminem is the greatest lyricist of all time. How can they say that? Because you said hip hop was for everybody. You said jazz was for everybody. You said soul food was for everybody. You said African spirituality was for everybody. We even got white people being initiated in traditional African spiritual systems. You mean to tell me we liberated Haiti with voodoo and you're going to train white people in the art of voodoo to sign the overture turning in his grave. John Jacques Dessalines turning over in his grave. Here's the question. Is there anything sacred to black people? And what I mean by that, is there anything we love so much and cherish so much that we would not sell it for a price? This is nothing. Can you think of? I can't think of one thing. I can't think of one thing that is so sacred to black people. Nobody can touch it if they're not black. Can you think of something? The N word. They you touch. Talk, they touch that. What you talking about? <laughs> you talking about? Jay Z defended Eminem when he used it. Stephen A. Smith de- uh, defended Dante G- Divincenzo of the Milwaukee Bucks, formerly of Villanova, oh, when he used it. Oh, what you yeah. talking about? Somebody just sent me a clip yesterday of some white kid calling black kids niggas in the class. You know what? You know what's so crazy about that is it was a football player. I think a five star recruit was supposed to go to Florida Gators. Um, some white boy that and they pulled right his, in the song. They pulled the scholarship. His, and Candace Owens the is person, defending him. And 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 the person who made the song is saying, I think that that uh punishment is a little too harsh for him. Now compare that to Kyrie's to Kyrie tweet. tweet. I ain't seen, yeah, I ain't, we are expected to not respect ourselves. Yeah. We are expected to okay. not hold people accountable. Let me say this to your listening audience. The Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy, we can use your donations. Get your cash app. Our to- donations are tax deductible. We are a tax exempt organization. Get on your cash app, dollar sign FDMG school. I repeat, dollar sign FDMG school. Get on your PayPal for my international Africans, paypal.me slash FDMG Academy. That's paypal.me slash FDMG Academy. You can also mail your check of money order payable to the FDMG Academy, P.O. Box 9634, Wilmington, Delaware, 19809. You can get all that information on my website, drumarjohnson.com. For my parents out there, if you need any consultations for your children, if you need somebody to help you determine if you want to get them evaluated for autism or reading disabilities, intellectual disabilities, ADHDs, conduct disorders, feel free to reach out to me. Don't forget, no charge for me to review your child's intellectual disability evaluation for free. If you have a child who's been classified as intellectually disabled, i.e. mentally retarded, please email me the evaluation. Dr. Umar Johnson at Yahoo.com. I do not charge to review intellectual disability evaluations because black kids are four times as likely as white children to be called retarded when they're not. Again, that's D-R-U-M-A-R Johnson at Yahoo.com. But you can reach me by text message at 215-989-9858. 215-989-9858 and don't forget to sign up for my video on demand platform drumar.tv www.drumar.tv and in the words of the most honorable Frederick Douglass it is better to raise strong children than to repair broken men black power what's your socials too your, uh, your social media is what's your uh, social Instagram? media you can follow me on Clubhouse at Prince Ifa Tunde on TikTok at Prince Ifa Tunde on Facebook Dr. Umar Ifa Tunde and on Twitter and Instagram at Dr. Umar Johnson. I have several fake pages out there that the coons made gonna, up. I was going so go to mention my website. Yeah, go to drumarjohnson.com and you can click on the right social media from my webpage. Please donate to the school. God willing, we will be having a grand opening in February of 2023. Stay tuned. If you want to work at the school, send your resume. FDMG resumes. That's F-D-M-G-R-E-S-U-M-E-S at gmail.com. Resume, cover letter, photo. Ladies, don't forget. 
You must be 100% happy to be nappy if you're going to work at my school. <laughs> Fellas, don't forget, if you got the snow bunny crisis, you can keep that resume to yourself. Black power. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Umar, for coming through, man. No I really appreciate it. No problem, it. King. Appreciate it. But he ain't never met his pop Cause he was locked in the box With three hots in the cop Man, they stole niggas Sold niggas